guests today are Sam Basu and Michael Crump. Michael, Sam, how you doing? Hey, doing great. How about you? Doing great. Uh, for those who don't know, what do you guys do? I'm a developer advocate with Telerik. And I'm also a developer advocate at Telerik. Telerik. Now I think of uh, Telerik, uh, like a lot of people, I think of controls. Uh, but Telerik, Telerik's a lot more than that. You guys are building this uh, this whole app studio thing, formerly known as uh, what Isenium. was it called? As Isenium. So, uh, and uh, and I know this in part because we did a show on App Studio about six months ago, maybe. And um, but a lot lots changed since then, right? Yeah, a lot has changed. Yeah. So what's 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 new in App Studio these days? Sure. And um, first up, good to be on your show again. I think <laughs> we're both uh, ex victims. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple X victims. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, what we want to talk about today is like mobile apps, and everyone's building it. We have multiple platforms to support iOS, Android, Windows, and other other platforms. Um, it's a dilemma for developers. How do you go about doing this? Mm -hmm. Because if you're an indie developer, you can make it for one app. We are all, I mean, one platform. We are all big fans of going native for each platform, but you're going to strive to make it on all platforms, right? Sure, and I think it looks like, I, it's probably safe to say that three platforms that yes. are emerged is yep. really viable right now. I don't want to diss BlackBerry, but sure. that their time might have passed. Right. But iOS, Android, and Windows and Windows. seem to be the three that are And for right. enterprises, it's a bigger dilemma because you do want your app on across all platforms, but it's expensive to get development teams who are confident in each of these native platforms. Right. So the big push that we're seeing is cross-platform mobile development. And there are a couple of ways in which you can go about it. Um, you can do all-out C-sharp with Xamarin, mm -hmm. um, or you can do cross-platform hybrid uh, development, which is what we are fans of. And that's where you use your web skills, your HTML5, CSS, and JavaScript skills to build mobile apps which feel like native apps across all platforms. Oh. And that's where uh, a lot of our efforts in the last year or so have gone into. We have come up with this thing called the Telerik platform. Mm -hmm. which really is end-to-end -end mobile with everything that a mobile developer or an enterprise might need to have a successful app in the store. Because there are several steps to this. You have to get your app prototyped, you have to develop your app, you have to test your app, have the right services, and then once you release your app, um, get it into the marketplace, maybe have a private store where you want to deploy. Uh, how is your app doing? You might want to have user feedback, you might want to have analytics to tell you how, you, how exactly your app is performing, how your users are using it. So that's where the Telerik platform comes into play, trying, just trying to equip you with everything end-to-end -end mobile. Hmm. Okay, what about App Studio? What's, uh, what's true about App Studio today that wasn't true six months ago? Yes, yeah, so uh, App Builder is actually the official name now. App Builder, I'm sorry. Oh, it's okay. They, <laughs> uh, the, hey, the names sometimes change around. Yep. But uh, so with App Builder, there has been Visual Studio integration that in the past. I think on one of your previous shows, uh, uh, Visual Studio was talked about. Mm -hmm. We've changed some templates uh, since then. We've made a couple of templates that were a little bit easier now to work with. Uh, you know, are kind of, we're kind of fans of the hamburger kind of menu where you kind of have a slide out menu. Okay. We've added a couple of those in. We've even got templates now that are completely vanilla. So there's nothing added. So if you don't want to use jQuery or you don't want to use even Kendo, um, you don't have to use those. So that's built in. And also the upgrade path is really great for Visual Studio. So if you're on 2010, 2012, or 2013, all three of those works out of the box. These are, these are plugins for Visual Studio. Exactly. So you'll go into uh, you'll go into Visual Studio and you can select a template mm -hmm. and under like, like underneath Telerik there will be like App Builder and then you can select your template that you would like to start with. Is that with a um, I know there's a lot of Microsoft developers that watch my show I think uh, just because I I have a lot of dot .net guests on. Um, is it file new project? Yes. And then there's a an app builder project template yeah, yes okay. and and underneath that well you have to go to the Telerik node okay and then from there uh, th there's five templates that, that okay. are out there that's that's available for you to use and there's also uh, from your menu bar there's an app builder uh, menu that you can select okay. and from that drop down you can do things like configure your project uh, from project settings to maybe some artwork and okay. even like build and deploy and set it to the cloud. I see. But that's just some of the improvements in the Visual uh, Studio. We still have another client if you would like to use that. So we have another Windows IDE client that you can use. Hmm. If you, that's a standalone client. Yes, uh, absolutely standalone client. And this is for people that, you know, they don't have U Visual Studio. Sure. Maybe they choose not to use Visual Studio. There's a CLI that uh, Sam will mention. 
and that there's uh, also, uh, you can use the end browser. So you don't even really need to have uh, something installed on your machine. That's where this all started, right? The first it version was all in browser and all the cloud. Yes, everything was just, you just go to a web browser and you go to the URL, uh, platform.telerik.com, and you can, can start and your project kind of from there. It was an integrated there. cloud environment, as I recall. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, ice. <laughs> ice, anium. Ice, yeah. anium. So, Which uh, was a better name, by the way. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all an umbrella. I don't know. <laughs> so that's kind of a quick breakdown of the of some of the different sorts of IDEs that you can you can work with. And um, one of the things I think that may be kind of important to mention while we're talking about this is um, using the CLI and especially with like Sublime. Oh, and so CLI is uh, command line interface. Okay. And uh, I'd let Sam run with uh, that, maybe with Sublime, or what you've used it with in the past. Sure. So, again, the the thing that we're trying to get across is freedom for developers. Mm -hmm. Pick your ID, pick whatever you're comfortable in. If Visual Studio is your thing, stay in Visual Studio all right. day long, and you can go from file new project all the way up to the store from every one of these IDs. Mm, so okay. there are five or six that we support. There is Visual Studio. There is the Windows stand-in client. There is an in-browser client. There is a command line interface, um, so I think that's that's the four that come to mind right away. Uh, and all of these things are meant to empower you to use um, whatever you want. Oh, and the mm -hmm. last one is the Sublime Text, which is a very popular text editor with a lot of web guys. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So in any one of these five or six platforms, you can go from file new to all the way up to the store. Um, there are a couple of ones which we are really proud of, like the in-browser client. It's quite fantastic to be um, staying in your Visual Studio or Sublime IDE all day long, but the fact that you can just go pull up a browser with your little Surface or iPad mini or in, sure. a, in a coffee shop and start your development, and, and you can just pick up from where you left off because all of these, um, these plugins across multiple um, IDEs, you can hook up your project to like a GitHub or a TFS, mm -hmm. and then it all saves and syncs across uh, all of these IDEs. So mm. I could be at home on my, in my Visual Studio uh, on my laptop, then when I go to a coffee shop, I can just pick up from where I left off on the web. Sure. And the or web if I'm has a client site that doesn't have any tools installed on their machines. Exactly. And you use this one. Exactly. So, and the thing that we are kind of proud of is a lot of .NET developers now want to write apps for iOS and Android because we are in sure. this hybrid world. Um, maybe you, you do not have a Mac. Maybe you are not equipped enough to do like Android development. Oh, this is big. So I can use uh, App Builder and create an uh, iOS app without owning a Mac. Absolutely, without owning a Mac whatsoever, and all the way up to the um, Apple App Store. Mm -hmm. And you can do this across any of these IDEs, like the in-browser client. Uh, it's actually pretty rich. You have nice code editing. You have a solution explorer. You have an output window, which kind of looks like Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. And then you can fire off the simulators from inside Visual Studio, inside in-browser client, inside the uh, stand-in client, all of them have in uh, inbuilt iOS, Android, and Windows Phone simulators. Mm. So you can test as much as you want on the simulators. They do some nice uh, simulation of network strength, geolocation, and so on. Mm -hmm. But okay. then when um, you want to actually deploy it, the apps to your device, and see how it's functioning, because I mean that's what most mobile developers do. You want to see your app on a device. We try to make it really easy. So you can fire off a build and say, which platform do you want to build on? The same app, keep in mind, this is just HTML, JavaScript, and CSS assets that you're packaging up using Apache Cordova. So when you say, give me a build, we're gonna ask, what platform do you want? And accordingly, we're gonna create an app package which is meant for Windows Phone, iOS, and Android. And then you get a simple QR code. You can scan it on your phone, and it just side, side loads directly into your phone, right. which can be a full app package, mm -hmm. if that's what you want, or, it could be um, using something we call a companion app, which is available on, again, each of the app stores. What mm. it is is just a shell, okay. which can host your app. Your app is gonna be full screen in each of the platforms, and it looks like any other native app, but you just don't need your app, to, uh, your phone to be unlocked, like developer unlocked, because mm. then it just, um, it just installs the app from inside of our companion app. Mm. And the three finger, uh, one of the extra benefits is the three finger kind of refresh with the companion app that Sam was just talking about. Live sync. Uh, live sync just is uh, wonderful. So once you have actually scanned the QR code, this is on a developer unlocked device, mm -hmm. uh, you can use three fingers on the screen and then pull down and it's, live, it's called live sync mm -hmm. and it'll pull down your latest build. Oh. So I could actually be inside Visual Studio 
and I could make a change, and I could have an iPhone, you know, right beside me, and I could make a change to whatever, uh, just say text, for example, like, you know, uh, yeah, telling me. Expelling error, for example. Expelling error. And I could actually use the three-finger uh, swipe, and I could refresh my application on my phone. And what's really great about this is that the QR code that Sam mentioned, um, I, I find that whenever I'm presenting or I'm you know, showing people what that they can do, the QR code that's generated, I uh, will make that available on the screen. Mm -hmm. And as we are actually building the application out, as long as everybody has downloaded the companion app, they can actually watch the changes on their devices oh, without yeah. paying any sort of fee. Uh, like they normally would have to pay for. When Apple has a $99 individual fee, right. Google's 25 and you know, obviously my, uh, Microsoft has a small fee for, uh, right now. for a Windows phone. But, but that bypasses all of that. And, and it's been it's a great learning experience I've, because I've been to some colleges as well and just people seem to love that, that functionality. Is, that, is there a companion app for each app that you build or is there one companion app to rule them all? So each platform has a companion app that you download. <coughs> so I'll usually start off a presentation with, hey, go out to the Telerik store, I mean, I'm sorry, go out to your app store, regardless of which platform you're using, and search for the word Telerik, mm -hmm. and then you'll find an application called App Builder, Telerik App Builder. Download that application. Once you've downloaded that application, there is where you can scan in, then is when you can scan in the QR code. And they scan it in, and then, then we just start working and building. Right, so once, once you have, for example, the iOS companion app, you could download all. You could download my my app and your app and uh, the, the app you build next to the second one. So with that kind of go, kind of, there's another piece to that part of it that kind of ties in with like App Manager, okay. which we may go into a little, little bit detail. But with this part of it, it would be like one kind of app okay. at a time. Um, oh, but, so it's but, specifically tied to an app that I'm building today. Yes. Okay. All yes. Right. But there's so, one tomorrow. But, yeah. We yeah. have we have a, a we have a solution for that as well in App Manager. Um, mm -hmm. um, if we want to touch on. Sure. Just describe what it is. Well, uh, what what Michael is referring to is really the mobile management tool where you can have multiple apps deployed into a private store. But um, to your point. Yes, there is a single companion app for iOS, Android, and Windows. Uh -huh. And as you're developing one app today, and you develop another one tomorrow, it's the same app. You just push push down the new bits. Oh, okay. So you don't need newer apps or newer companion apps for every new app that you build. Okay. That three finger refresh or live sync uh, will take care of that. I see. Uh, with that, though, are the new features that we haven't talked about? Yes. So a couple of new things that we are proud of is if you're inside of Vision Studio you have your NuGet package manager. So you can bring down other third-party DLLs. What do you do on the web? Because the JavaScript board operates slightly differently, right? Mm -hmm. So that's where you have your um, node package managers for the server side. You have something called Bower for the client side, which is to manage and version your JavaScript libraries which you're using inside of your app. Mm -hmm. So we now have a Bower package manager inbuilt inside of App Builder, and you can just right-click on your project and bring in jQuery bring in Angular, bring in Knockout, any of the JavaScript frameworks that you want to play with, mm -hmm. and it will be automatically versioned, and all of its dependencies will be managed uh, for you inside of your project. Interesting. In the Cordova plugins. Yeah. So the other thing, uh, you want to talk about it? Maybe? Sure. Uh, so Cordova plugins is something that's used just extensively. Okay, so we should back up a little. Define Cordova first. Yeah, so Cordova, uh, basically uh, there's a couple of branches. So there's PhoneGap, <coughs> and then there was uh, PhoneGap, <coughs> gave the Apache Foundation Cordova. Cordova is kind of its own sort of kind of thing. And it's something that anybody can freely um, work on and, and, and help. And so Telerik is absolutely a part of that. Yeah, um, so let me, uh, let me paraphrase that. So Cordova is an open source, open source for building uh, cross-platform mobile apps. And App Builder is basically a branch of that. So uh, not not quite, but let me let me rephrase. So here's what's going on. So so let me back up a few years and kind of see where we are with Cordova right now. PhoneGap, as we know it today, uh, is different from PhoneGap a couple of years back. So PhoneGap managed to do the team working on PhoneGap managed to do two uh, magical things. One is they figured out a way to write JavaScript proxies to the native APIs for mm -hmm. iOS, Android, and Windows Phone. 
So the way you access the camera, on it, for example, for iOS, is different the way from you, uh, I mean, how you access it on Android or Windows Phone. But if we give you an abstraction in JavaScript, so you write one line in JavaScript to say, get me the camera feed, and then it translates that down to the native API for each platform. Mm -hmm. So that's the JavaScript proxies for each APIs on every platform. And then they figured out a way to package up all your web resources, your HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, and any other JavaScript framework that you use into an app package. Because as much as Apple, Microsoft, and Google are different, their app packages are about the same. They're all zip files mm -hmm. with slightly different like configurations. There's an AppX for Windows, there's an IPA, and there's an APA, APK. But they're essentially zip files. So we can package up all of your uh, web assets, deploy them as a native app, which is the big win compared to like going mobile web because you don't have a uh, store presence with mobile web. Right. With cross-platform hybrid, you actually get to be in the store and monetize your app and do all of those things. Your apps, actually, if they're written nicely, they look and behave just like uh, native apps. Mm -hmm. And this is particularly tr true if you're like a Facebook or a PayPal or maybe even like any enterprise line of business app because you want your app experience to be about the same on every platform. Yep. You might have a little tweak here and there for each platform, but you want to have your Facebook experience the same. True. And you want to have, really want to have one code base, so you're not maintaining three different things for three different platforms. And that's where the HTML and CSS and JavaScript magic really comes into play. And underneath all of this, this Cordova, is how you're accessing the native APIs for each platform. And we bundle all of that up into an application package that we can distribute either to the public store or to the private store. Okay, does it make sense? Yes, it does. Okay, that was an aside <laughs> to explain uh, Cordova stuff. We were, aside from what? What were we talking about? We're talking about more features, right? The more the new features. More features? Yeah, in yeah. Studio or other, other places. Like, what's new? Yeah, so another thing was we have upgraded in the past month or so from uh, Apache Cordova 3.2 to 3.5. Obviously, you'd want to be, be working with some of the latest stuff, and we've created our own uh, plugin site. So, if you wanted to check out our, our plugin marketplace, uh, you would be able to do that. So, for example, uh, social sharing is something that's just absolutely huge. Everybody wants to be able to social share in their Cordova based applications. Hashtag I do. Exactly. <laughs> so, you would be able to go to the store and you would be able to search through, and you can actually uh, drill down to whichever uh, uh, phone you may be targeting. Obviously, we would hope you'd be targeting all three mm -hmm. uh, platforms, and you can grab the social sharing. You can add that to your project as plugins. There's a script reference in JavaScript, and then it would bring up the native, um, the native like social sharing dialog box that you would normally screen, normal, normally see. Like in iOS, it would pop up kind of from the bottom, and give your options, you know, for like Twitter or Facebook or whatever you may already have installed uh, to share in it through AirDrop. Or if you have uh, an Android phone, uh, you know, you could it would bring up the native uh, native dialog box that you would see in those native applications. Mm, okay. So that's another big benefit that a lot of people have been using, uh, and that's something that we we have been contributing to as well as we've been working with different partners and. Uh, We've been building out some of these plugins. We've been adding them to our side, kind of as we, uh, kind of as we go. Mm, okay. So uh, the other thing maybe um, to mention is uh, something that's really nice for developers is you want to have a single code base that targets all these mobile platforms. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you want those subtle nuances on how an iOS app looks a little different from an Android app and a Windows app because I mean they all have their own design paradigms, right? So you are absolutely free to bring in any JavaScript library, any UI components that you want to play with on the client side. Mm -hmm. But you get some benefits if you bring in something like Kendo UI. And Kendo UI Mobile has about 20 or 25 different UI components which are specifically targeted for mobile applications. I see. So what you get is something called adaptive rendering. So you have a simple like a menu, something that you would strip on, uh, or maybe like even a tab strip something that you can throw on your, on your app, it'll be just a single control for you, but it's going to render differently based on the platform that you're on. That's so for iOS, you get the little tab strip at the bottom mm -hmm. with the different tabs. For Windows Phone, you get, you get the little circles, 
And for Android, Android users are used to seeing the tab strips on the top, so that's where it's going to be rendered. But again, keep in mind this is all the same control. Yeah. So more flexibility for the developer, you get to use just one control and it adapts to whichever platform you're on. And part of the reason why we're able to do this is inside the, uh, inside the app, which the user doesn't get to notice, there is a giant web view which is actually rendering all of these apps. And we can use the user agent on these web browsers to figure out which platform the user is on right. and customize the user experience that way. Yeah, so a lot of the uh, responsive design controls are moving less towards the uh, uh, what platform and more just to the screen size. Sure. Right? Users are smarter than that. They actually can tell a similar screen size whether it's, whether it's iOS versus Android versus Windows Phone. Right, right. So we can sense what platform you're on. And also, I mean, we'll do the regular responsive web design. I mean, if you throw in like a grid or a scheduler, which is a heavy control, if you make a single web app that maybe works for your desktop applications, and you want to bring that same thing to a mobile experience, we're going to listen to the viewport and figure out this is really a mobile device. So we're going to shrink the display and, and make it touch friendly and all of the best. Um, and the other thing uh, we kind of added in the last year or so is something we, like Michael was saying, command line interface. Because a lot of enterprises, in particular, have their own build processes. You might want to right. have scripts that do nightly builds every afternoon or something, or like every hour. You are you have a development team who's working on your on your app, your project, and you want to kick off a build, and you want some things to be automated, like kicking off the build, getting your app deployed uh, through to the simulators and so on, and, and testing it. So command line interface is just doing it through the command line, which is DOS prompt in, in Windows. And for OS X, it's the OS X Bash, and all of those, I mean, both of those two things are actually dependent on Node.js underneath. Mm -hmm. So we have a Node.js plugin which you can uh, install through npm on both Windows and OS X, mm -hmm. and it's going to get you the command line tool. So you can say, App Builder, create this project. App Builder, go ahead and build this project. App Builder, go ahead and distribute this project and simulate this project on, on the simulators and so on. Mm -hmm. And one other one that was actually just added, um, and I think it's very important to at least bring it up, is that, so uh, as Sam was saying, we have, uh, out of the box, we have simulators that are available. It pops up as soon as you hit the run button. So just like we're used to, kind of like with Windows Phone apps or whatever, you hit the run button and it pops up a dialog screen, and you can choose between iOS uh, and Android and Windows Phone. Well, some people actually want to test this on the emulators that were created by Microsoft, for example, uh, Windows Phone, where they may want to test the one that uh, Google created mm -hmm. with Android. So now we have support for the native emulators uh, that, that the manufacturers actually built. So you may not have uh, an Android device. Right. I know I didn't have an Android device at uh, one point, and you know I was looking, you know, at some different, you know, simulators and things like that. But there was also some things that you couldn't necessarily test. And the emulators, um, even though they may, um, you know, even though they, they, there may be still some things missing, like with us taking a camera, screenshots, and things like that. They give you also a very good uh, feel of how the application is going to run. And right now we have support for Windows Phone and for Android and iOS is coming up very, very soon. Anything else? Well, let me add one last thing. And this okay. is... Um, Always one last thing. Always one last thing. This is not quite ready for production users right now, but oh. it's coming and we are super excited about this. So um, keep in mind all of these hybrid apps that we are building, cross-platform hybrid apps, they run fine across all platforms. On any newer phone, it's going to look just like a native app, and you're going to have that continual experience across devices. But it's still a hybrid app. So you wrote that with web technologies, it's running inside of a web view. Something we are calling uh, native script is coming up towards the end of this year, 2014, or early next year. Mm -hmm. It is where you can actually write native applications in iOS, Android, and Windows Phone through pure JavaScript. Mm -hmm. So you say, give me a list box that displays some data. You do all of that in HTML and JavaScript. We are going to compile that down into a native list box for iOS, Android, and Windows Phone, and hmm. still make it work with the data that you have. Hmm. So that's, that's coming. That's something we are very excited with. But um, the bottom line is it's 2014, uh, and we are in this world of hybrid uh, applications and different mobile platforms. We have a dizzying array of devices in our lives, all the way sure. from a smartphone, yeah. tablet, 
Ultrabook, your TV and so on. Mm -hmm. So let's not just target one platform. Let's try to get all of them. So hit the maximum number of users that you can. Pick your mobile strategy so that lets you um, actually achieve that goal. And just one last thing is that, um, uh, I know we will keep saying one last thing, <laughs> is that uh, also uh, included um, with the platform is uh, our native controls for iOS and Android. So a lot of people have known us for making a lot of .NET components. We're also making uh, native iOS and Android components as well. Mm -hmm. And with that, usually the question usually comes up about Xamarin. And uh, Xamarin is absolutely on our roadmap uh, to create Xamarin bindings for those iOS and Android native controls. And we just released a beta of our native Windows Universal controls. So that's just one last thing I just wanted to add. So just giving developers really the choice, giving them the freedom. You know, you pick and choose. Yeah. You know, what's your best, what's the best thing for your company? Guys, thanks a lot. Thank you. A lot of thanks exciting you. stuff. Now. Michael and I have loved talking about technology with my friend David Giard.